welcome once again to the family life presentation and uh, i'm glad for what the lord is doing for us and the father he has carried us we are studying how to raise our children and this is uh, part two of uh, the presentation and in details in the previous presentation we looked at uh, how to prepare uh, uh, as a, a mother a husband or a wife to be able to uh, get a child and how to raise up the child. And now we have reached uh, the stage where the child is growing and we want just to look at a few things because um, parenting is not, it's not a simple thing per se, but it is part of the third angel's message where we have to raise up children who shall be able to represent the image of Christ fully not on our own strength, but uh, the strength that uh, God will give us. And so many times we find that um, it becomes difficult in raising up these children. And questions have been asked, where may be the problem in raising up these children? What is the problem and how can people approach this issue of raising up children in a, a godly way. So today I'll be just um, trying to uh, look into inspiration and uh, see uh, what um, we are told, what we are told on this very important issue. It is always good that um, we go back to the inspiration because um, our own thoughts, our own thoughts are not sufficient to uh, bring us up to the standard the Lord would want us to, to, to bring the children in. And so um, the question is, where is the trouble? Where is the trouble? In Child Garden, page 126, paragraph 1, uh, we are told, the trouble it is with the parents who let their children come up without bearing any burdens in the family. When these children go out to school, they say, Ma says she doesn't want me to work. Such a mother are foolish. They spoil their children and then send them to the school to spoil it. Work is the very best discipline they can give. It is no harder for them than for their mothers. Blend the physical labor with the mental and the powers of the mind will develop far better. Now, just going back to the definition of um, true education, because this is essential in uh, raising up the children. True education is the harmonious development of the physical, the mental, and the spiritual. And uh, no education can be termed as a wholesome education where children are only taught a one part of uh, upgrowing. In fact, when uh, you go to the book of Luke, and that is where I'm headed, how did Jesus Christ himself go in the book of Luke, chapter 2, verse uh, 52? Uh, this is what we get. And this should be the example of every parent in raising up their children. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. So we have here uh, the, uh, the mental, we have here the physical, and we have the spiritual uh, aspect of it. And so Jesus grew up harmoniously. The parents made sure that they could provide a harmonious development for this child. And also, that is what we found with the child uh, Samuel. Uh, the child Samuel, if I get the verse, I'll be able to project it. Um, this child, how the mother decided that uh, it should grow. Um, the, the, the mother, in, in, in the book of uh, First Samuel chapter 2, verses 26. We are seeing that the, the, the development of the child, most of it is hampered by their parents uh, because the parents only concentrate on one side of uh, bringing up the children. 
They think that taking the children into school and paying their school fees, that is the raising up of children. But uh, the children grow mentally, but they do not grow physically and spiritually uh, harmoniously. And so we are looking at the example of Jesus Christ, how he was raised up. He grew in stature, in wisdom, in wisdom, in stature, and in favor with God and man. Also the child Samuel. And the child Samuel grew on and was in favor with the Lord and also with the men. So he grew in stature, he grew mentally, and he grew physically and spiritually. And that is how we are to raise up our children. We don't have to be the problem in the growing up of um, the children. Again, we are told children are to be educated to deny themselves. At one time when I was speaking in Nashville, the Lord gave me light on this matter. It flashed upon me with great force that in every home there should be a self-denial box and that into this box the children should be taught to put their pennies uh, they would otherwise spend for candy and other unnecessary things. Now, you would think that this is so harsh on children having a self-denial box, but um, uh, this is meant to inculcate in children the sacrificial uh, attitude of Jesus Christ himself, who had everything in heaven, but uh, gave it up for the salvation of men. And so children should be taught to grow up in a selfless way, emulating the child and the man, Jesus Christ, in their role. And so this is the duty of the parents to make sure that these children are being brought up in a way that um, is not selfish. Um, again, this is uh, what we read, that um, in, uh, in child guidance again, And uh, I just uh, encourage people to read uh, this uh, book. Child Guidance 132.3. Children of two to four years of age should not be encouraged to think that they must have everything that they ask for. Parents should teach them lessons of self-denial and never treat them in such a way as to make them think they are the center and that everything revolves about them. And we 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 are warned we were we are warned about um, idolatry. People worship different things in their life. There are those who worship their money. There are people who worship their jobs, and there are people who worship even their children. And so we should be very careful and very afraid to be found worshiping our children by thinking that everything must be centered upon them and everything that they need they have to be given. Many children have inherited selfishness from their parents, but uh, parents should seek to uproot every fiber of this evil tendency from their natures. Christ gave many reproofs to those who are covetous and selfish. Parents should seek on the first exhibition of selfish traits of character, whether in their presence or when in association with other children, to restrain and approve these traits from the character of their children. How carefully should parents manage their children in order to counteract every inclination to selfishness? They should continually suggest ways by which their children may become thoughtful for others and learn to do things for their fathers and mothers who are dying, who are uh, doing everything for them. Child guidance 133.3. Again, practice economy in your homes. By many idols, by many idols are cherished and worshipped. Put away your idols. Give up your selfish pleasure. Do not, I beg of you, absorb means in embellishing your houses, for it is God's money, and it will be required of you again. Parents, for Christ's sake, do not use the Lord's money to please the families of your children. Do not teach them to seek after style and ostentation in order to obtain an influence in them. Well, and uh, on this point of um, where the parents have made their children the center of attraction and have become idolatrous about it, we are told that if you have gone wrong, it's a time that you repented. And uh, I'll quote from um, Paul's counsel to parents, PCP, Paul's counsel to 
parents, I think it should be page uh, 29. But when I reach there, I'll let you know false counsel to parents, uh, page um, 29, paragraph 2. False counsel to parents, page uh, 29.2. Um, here is what uh, inspiration has to say. Brethren and sisters, I beg of every one of you to make the most of this come meeting. If you have backslidden, I entreat you for Christ's sake to return to him. Be reconverted. Let the conversations begin today. Let parents confess to their children in regard to the points on which they have neglected their duty. Let them confess their negligence in regard to allowing their children to follow the passions and to mingle in worldly society simply because they wanted to be like the world. It is possible, it is impossible for us to be Christ-like while we are world-minded. We cannot separate ourselves from the world itself. We must remain in the world but we should separate from it is evil practices. It is wrong ideas, it is sinfulness. We should practice self-denial in everything in order to have power by living faith in Christ to claim the richest promises given us in his uh, word. And so children should not be taught to be the center of attraction. And this is the quote we were dealing with that um, um, uh, that um, do not educate your children to think that your love for them must be expressed by indulging their pride, their extravagant, their love of display. There is no time now to invent ways of using money. Your inventive faculties have to be put to the scratch to see how you can economize. You have brought children into the world who have had no voice in regard to their existence. You have made yourself responsible in a great measure for their future happiness, their eternal well-being. The burden is upon you whether you are sensible of it or not. To train these children for God to watch with jealous care the first approach of their will for and be prepared to raise a standard against him. And uh, this is a strong point that is being advocated here. Children did not apply to be born. It is you and your husband or whichever way you decided to bring someone in this world. And so we are being warned of being careless of these children we have brought in this world. It is not their choice to come in this world. And so it is your duty because these children had no choice in coming to, the, to this world to make sure that you do everything in your capacity at your disposal to make sure that these children understand so long as, uh, even though they didn't apply to be in this world, but uh, there is uh, an important role they have to play uh, as they have found themselves in this world. So uh, don't give your burden to other people. Don't make your burden, uh, uh, your duty to be the duty of others. And we can only help where we can as a child, but the first duty belongs to the parent, him or herself, to make sure that the children are being brought up in the admonition of the Lord. And uh, it is not mercy or kindness to permit a child to have its own way to submit to its rule. I neglect to correct it on the ground that you love it too well to punish it. What kind of love is it that permits your child to develop traits of character that will make him and everyone else miserable? Away with such a love. True love will look out for the present and eternal good of the soul. Just to indulge the child and say it is love, it is something that uh, God takes it seriously that uh, this should not be so. Um, and... Uh, just uh, there's a statement that uh, E.G. White makes that uh, is uh, a very interesting point. The cry of the mother or the cry of uh, a parent. And I'll put it on the screen because sometimes um, these things when we read uh, them, they make an impression unto us. 
And so, uh, first of all, I'll read from uh, uh, messages to the young messages to the young people, page eighty-seven, paragraph three and eighty-eight, paragraph one. Uh, this issue of uh, indulging the children and uh, them becoming a reproach, and you wouldn't want to correct them because you say that this is love. Uh, we have something interesting where Sister White talks about Sabbath keepers' children. She says in Messages to the Young People, page 87, paragraph 3, the children of Sabbath keepers, the children of Sabbath keeping parents who have had great light, who have been the objects of the tender solitude, may be the ones who will leave a heritage of shame, who will sow to the wind and reap the whirlwind. In the judgment, the names of those who have sinned against great light will be will be written with those who are condemned to be separated from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. They will be lost, lost, and will be numbered with the scorners of the grace of Christ. And look at this statement. I would rather see my children laid in the grave than see them taking the path that leads to death. The terrible fact that I had nurtured children to fight against the God of heaven, to swell the ranks of apostates in the last days, too much under the black ban of Satan will indeed be a thought of horror to me. The same quote is given somewhere with some added information, the cry of a mother. And uh, 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 amplifying it, she talks about uh, uh, sending children to schools where they will have habits that will corrupt them and they may not serve the Lord in a, a better way. Uh, here she says, uh, here she has something to say in uh, letter PH 131. Uh, is obedience to all the commandments of God taught, taught the children in their first, in the very first lesson? Is sin represented uh, as an offense toward God? I'll rather that children grow up in ignorance of school education as it is today and employ uh, some other means to teach them. And why would she have such a statement? Because we allow our children 12 hours with the people who do not believe the same way we believe. I may say, uh, 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 forgive me for the exaggeration, we allow people to have our children for eight or seven hours in a day in that they are in schools and the people who are dealing mostly with them, they do not believe the way we do. Some are atheists, some are just opposers of truth, some are debate, educated debaters, and some are so immoral. And these are the people who spend seven to eight hours with our children. And when our children come back to us, we see character that is really uh, very different from what we are teaching them or bringing them uh, in. And we wonder, how is my child so like this? There is nothing to wonder about. The person that the child spends most of the time with is the person that the child will adapt its character to. And so let us stop wondering why our children are the way they are. It is because we have brought children on the face of the earth and left others to take care of these children and upbring them. And uh, uh, even some of the children do not know their parents. I say that uh, uh, to our own shame. The, the, the parents only have their children when they are eating their dinner or supper, and then it is bedtime. They do not even have a time for devotions. And the children wake up and the mother or the father is gone to their job and they have to sit under or to be taken care of a housemaid or a housemaid or a houseboy. Uh, and then they go to the school. And so this issue of children who have parents living like orphans is so rampant amongst us. And Eti Jones talks about this, that uh, instead of struggling and seeking to establish schools for the children, we should establish schools for the parents to teach them to be parents before we even establish the schools for the children to go and be educated. Because 
many among us are parents by the virtue of giving birth. They are mothers and fathers by virtue of uh, impregnating and giving birth, but they are not parents by the virtue and the duty of the name itself. And so children should not be indulged. And a thought that we have brought a children to run under the banner of uh, the opposers of truth should be a horror unto us. And so in Child Guide 193, paragraph 4, we are told that uh, it is during the first years of a child's life that his mind is most susceptible to impressions, either good or evil. During these years, decided progress is made in either a right or a wrong one, a right direction or a wrong one. On one hand, much worthless information may be gained. On the other hand, much solid, valuable knowledge. The strength of intellect, the substantial knowledge are possessions which the gold of a fear will not buy. Their price is above gold. The impressions made on the heart early in life are seen in after years. They may be buried, but they will seldom be obliterated. No wonder we are told that teach the child that it will go, and when it is old, it will never forget about it. Mothers, be sure that you properly discipline your children during the first three years of their lives. Do not allow them to form their wishes and desires. The mother must be mind for her child. The first three years is the time in which to bend the tiny twig. Mothers should understand the important attaching to this period. It is then that the foundation is laid. And uh, in some other places, she says that a child who has reached nine years, it is so hard to correct that child because the neuropaths have been uh, developed and the information has been imprinted there and undoing it is not a simple job. And so while they are still young, we are told one to three years is the age of forming the character towards the right side or the wrong side. And so this age is so critical. It saddens me that um, you find parents are so busy that they will take their children to daycare at the age of three. Others at the age of four or five children are taken into academies and others into um, uh, places that they shouldn't be taken. And the character are formed. By the time the child reaches nine years, they cannot change in any way. There can be a superficial uh, um, uh, profession unto obedience, but it is not from the inward because the inward has something else, but uh, the outside has something else. And so we should be careful who spends with our children in their formative years of one to nine years. And so the character of Napoleon Bonaparte, Bonaparte we are given an example of uh, how the character of this man was formed in Child Guidance, page 196, paragraph one. The character of Napoleon Bonaparte was greatly influenced by his training in childhood. And wise instructors inspired him with a love for conquest, forming mimic armies and placing him at their head as commander. Here was laid the foundation for his career of strife and bloodshed. Had the same care and effort been directed to making him a good man, imbuing his young heart with the spirit of the gospel, how widely different might have been his history. And so that is Napoleon Bonaparte for you. And then we are given the, the, the example of Hume and Voltaire. And you know that uh, many of these poems and the uh, literature that are read in schools are from these uh, called great thinkers who are not really great thinkers, but uh, the tools of the enemy of souls. It is said that Hume, the skeptic, was in early life a conscientious believer in the word of God. Just look at that. Being connected with a debating society, he was appointed to present the arguments in favor of infidelity. Once a believer in the one of God, now an educated debater. He studied with earnestness and perseverance, and his keen and active mind became imbued with the sophistry of skepticism. Ere long, he came to believe it is delusive teachings, and his whole 
afterlife bore the dark impress of infidelity. When Voltaire was five years old, he committed to memory an infidel poem, and the pernicious influence was never effaced from his mind. He became one of Saturn's most successful agents to lead men away from God. Thousands will rise up in the judgment and charge the ruin of their souls upon the infidel Voltaire. Now, we have what we call literature in school. And when you look at what is called literature in school and what is being taught, to recite poems, to uh, memorize skits, and all these are from infidel authors. And when we are told in child garden, when the children ask us, why are these things so? We do not have an answer. We, we should be careful what our children are being told to recite. And right now, and there seem to be um, a progression in this country on the system of education when the CBC, uh, that is competent-based curriculum, was introduced in this country. But um, upon examining this um, um, a system, once again, you find that uh, that which was to be good has been messed up with. You see children uh, in the name of nurturing talents being involved in things that you will never want. Children dancing, devil's dances in school, they are nurturing their talents. Children doing and dressing in things and singing music that uh, you will never think that this is a Christian singing. And so I just admonish parents to be careful in what is happening, both in this country and in wild wide. Children are memorizing and practicing things that in the future you will regret why you allow them to do such uh, things. Um, opportunities of uh, inestimable, uh, inestimable work, interests infinitely precious are committed to every mother. During the first three years of the life of Samuel the prophet, his mother carefully taught him to distinguish between good and evil. By every familiar object surrounding him, she sought to lead his thoughts up to the creator. In fulfillment of her vow to give her son to the Lord, with great self-denial, she placed him under the care of Eli, the high priest, to be trained for service in the house of God. His early training led him to choose to maintain his Christian integrity, what a reward was Hannah's, and what an encouragement to faithfulness in her example. Continued on, it is a sad fact that any weakness and indecision on the part of the mother is quickly seen by the children. And the tempter then works upon their minds, leading them to persist in following their inclination. If uh, parents would cultivate the qualities necessary for them to use in the proper training of their children, if they will plain delay before the children the rules they must follow and not suffer these rules to be broken, the Lord will cooperate with and bless both parents and children. What the child sees and hears is growing deep lines upon the tender mind, which no after circumstances in life can entirely efface. Child guidance 199. Young children, if left to themselves, learn the bad more readily than the good. Bad habits are greatest with the natural heart, and things which they see and hear in infancy and childhood are deeply imprinted upon their minds. And so, uh, you know that when sin came into the world, man was sold unto the carnal mind, and it was enemy to the law of God. Indeed, it could not subject itself into the obedience of the law of God. And so, children are susceptible to accept naturally the bad habits than they would accept the good habits. Your child needs the hand of wisdom to guide him aright. He has been allowed to cry for what he wanted until he has formed the habit of doing this. He has been allowed to cry for his father. Again and again, in his hearing, others have been told how he cries for his father until he makes it a point of doing this. Had I, your child, in three weeks he will be transformed. I will let him understand that my word was law and kindly but firmly I will carry out my purposes. I will not submit my will to the child's will. You will have a work to do here and you have lost much by not taking hold of it. Now, repeating the things that the child does 
while the child here is really strengthens the child in those things. Uh, you hear parents, oh, my child doesn't like porridge. And that is it, your child will not like porridge. You repeat these things until they become a habit of the child. You say, my child doesn't want to wear this or wouldn't want, like to wear this cloth. And the child will grow that way. My child doesn't love guests. And the child will continue not loving the guests. My child, my child, my child. And that is what your child will be. Never repeat the wrong things of your child in the child's presence because you strengthen that habit. It is good to repeat good things in the presence of your child and that will be inculcated in the child's life rather than repeating the negative things in the presence of the child. And you know that repetition makes impression. And so when you repeat the bad things, the child gets adopted to those things. When you repeat good things, the child gets adopted to that. Because this is a principle in the book of um, uh, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, um, I'll just go to 1 Corinthians um, uh, 3.18, this principle of um, repeating the best things. Uh, I think uh, this is uh, 2 Corinthians, 318, sorry, 2 Corinthians 318, we are told, but we all with open face beholding as in glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of God. So just understand the child is partaking of the Spirit in its presence. So if it is the Spirit of complaining, if it is the Spirit of negativity, that which the child is beholding, that is which it is being turned into. The spirit that it is in the presence of the child, it is the spirit that the child will partake. If it is the spirit of Christ, then the child is changed from glory to glory, even by the spirit of the Lord. If it is the spirit of Satan, then the child is changed in the very same image. And so we should be very careful what we repeat in the presence of the child. The mother's work commences with the infant. She should subdue the will and temper of the child and bring it into the subjection, teach it to obey. As child grows older, relax not the hand. Every mother should take time to reason with her children to correct their errors and patiently teach them the right way. Christian parents should know what they are instructing and fitting their children to become children of God. The entire religious experience of the children is influenced by the instruction given and the character formed in childhood. If the will is not then subdued and made to yield to the will of the parents, it will be a difficult task to learn the lesson in after years. What a severe struggle, what a conflict to yield that will, which never was subdued to the requirement of God. Parents who neglect this important work commit a great error and sin against their poor children and against God. So a wrong upbringing of the child is seen against that child and it is seen against God himself. To allow a child to follow his natural impulses is to allow him to deteriorate and to become proficient in evil. The results of wrong training begin to be revealed in childhood. In early youth, a selfish temper is developed, and as the youth grows to manhood, he grows in sin. Child guidance, 491 paragraph 2. Just be taking this reference, and uh, if you need the materials, don't hesitate to request for them. Freely, we have been given freely, uh, we shall give out. Faith, I live by, page 219, paragraph 4. Men and women frame many excuses for their proneness to sin. Sin is represented as a necessity, an evil that cannot be overcome. But sin is not a necessity. Christ lived in this world from infancy to manhood. And during that time, he made and resisted all the temptation by which man is beset. He is a perfect pattern of what? Childhood of youth of manhood. So we should not we should not just think Christ was a perfect person or was an example in adulthood. 
he was a perfect example for a child, for a youth, and for an adult. Never say that. I do not know if Christ was a good child when he was young. Yes, he was a good child. He grew in stature in favor with God and with man. And that is how our children should grow. How much, and uh, this is, um, I'm reading from uh, Review and Herald, July 16, 1895, paragraph 3. You will see the reference as we continue to read. How much corruption we see in the world because parents neglect to do their duty and sin lies at their door. Satan stands by exalting as you permit your children to pass into his hands. Do not indulge your children in evil ways, but from their very infants, let them see that you love the Lord and that you mean to train them up as he will have them, you. Our blessed Savior taught us to pray, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Do we realize what is the meaning of this prayer? Do we realize that we must hallow the name in our families and that if we allow our children to manifest the attributes of Satan, that name is not hallowed in our households? If we want the holy angels to take charge of our little ones, we must bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and teach them to hallow the name of God. We teach them to say, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But do you teach them in the meaning of them the meaning of this prayer? Do you teach them that the kingdom of God must be seen in your household and that the will of God must be done by them and you? Do you break the force of this petition by shaking them? by striking them in anger, by speaking harsh words and man manifesting passion, do not do this. Do not shake your child. Do not strike your child in anger and do not speak harsh words and words of passion to your child. Do not do this, but be merciful, kind and tender hearted. Let the will of the Lord be done in your family, not the will of the enemy. If mild measure will not avail, you must use the rod. You must give your children to understand God must be honored in your house, but this work is sadly neglected. Do you wonder that God does not walk through the midst of us when we allow Satan to walk his way, to work his way in our household, and when we neglect the solemn obligation that God has placed upon us? Of what avail will be a list of church resolutions if we have not the spirit of God in our homes? Christ is watching to see who are training their families for the great family above. Suppose one of your little children whom you have failed to correct should be taken away in one of its pits of timber. What will be the result? I leave you to answer the question. And you see, the example of Noah should be our example that he built the ark for his household. We should be building the up for our household. We should not neglect to bring the whole counsel of the Lord to our children and uh, make them understand that at any moment, evil is not to be allowed to have reign. In Science of the Time, July 17, 1884, paragraph 11, the Lord commanded Saul to utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. The Lord knew that this wicked nation would, if it were possible, blot out his people and his worship from the earth. And for this reason, he had commanded that even the little children should be cut off. And so the evil, that evil generation up, uh, up to the fourth generation could not be even allowed to live. Their children could not be allowed to live because they, they had um, acquired the second nature of evil. So we are told, and they, they, if they could have been allowed to live, then it could have been at the peril of the nation of Israel. In uh, uh, is this uh, Adventist you? And I, I'll just read on. Um, this is an appeal to the youth. An appeal to the youth, we are told, the Lord loves those little children who try to do right, and he has promised that they shall be in his kingdom. But wicked children God does not allow, referring to the Amalekite children above, 
He will not take them to the beautiful city for only ad, for he only admins, ad, admits the good, obedient, and patient children there. Again, as we bring this to a close, in Fundamental of Christian Education, page 29, paragraph 2, this is what we have. Many parents feel that they have so much to do that they have no time to improve their minds, to educate their children for practical life, or to teach them how they may become lambs of Christ's fall. Not until the final settlement, when the cases of all will be decided, and the acts of our entire lives be laid open to our view in the presence of God and the Lamb and all the holy angels, will parents realize the almost infinite value of their misspent time. Very many will then see that their wrong course has determined the destiny of their children. Not only have they failed to secure for themselves the words of commendation from the King of glory, well done thou good and faithful servant, enter thou into the joy of the Lord, but they here pronounced upon their children the terrible denunciation, depart this, separate their children forever from the joys and glories of heaven and from the presence of Christ. And they themselves also received the denunciation, depart thou wicked and slothful servant. Jesus will never say well done to those who have not earned the well done by their faithful lives of self-denial and self-sacrifice to do others good and promote and to promote his glory. Those who live principle to please themselves instead of to do others good will meet the infinite loss. And some parents allow certain to control their children, and their children are not restrained but are allowed to have wicked tempers, to be passionate, selfish, and disobedient. Should they die, these children will not be taken to heaven. The parents' course of action is determining the future welfare of their children. If they allow them to be disobedient and passionate, they are allowing Satan to take them in charge and work through them as shall please his satanic majesty. And these children, never educated to obedience and to lovely traits of character, will not be taken to heaven, for the same temper and disposition will be revealed in them. 3SM 315.2 this is the most delicate subject. Many unbelieving parents manage their children with greater wisdom than many of those who claim to be children of God. They take much pains with their children to make them kind, courteous, and selfish, and to teach them to obey. And in this, the unbelieving show greater wisdom than those parents who have the great light of truth, but whose works do not in any wise correspond with their faith. Parents should commend to discipline the minds of their children when they are young, to the end that they may be Christian, beware how you lull them to sleep over the feet of destruction with the mistaken thought that they are not old enough to be accountable, not old enough to repent of their sins and profess Christ. Children of 8, 10, or 12 years are old enough to be addressed on the subject of personal religion. Do not teach your children with reference to some future period when they shall be old enough to repent and believe the truth. If properly instructed, very young children may have correct views of their state as sinners and of the way of salvation through Jesus Christ. An eminent divine was once asked how old a child must be before there was reasonable hope of being a Christian. This was his answer. Age has nothing, nothing to do with it, was the answer. Love to Jesus Christ reposes. Confidence are all qualities that agree with the child's nature. As soon as the child can love and trust his mother, then can he love and trust Jesus as a friend of his mother. Jesus will be his friend, loved and honored, and praise the Lord for this answer. Children do not always discern rights from wrong, and when they do wrong, they are often treated harshly instead of being kindly instructed. The moment that the child begins to choose his own will and way, that moment his education in discipline is to begin. This may be called an unconscious education. It is then that a work, conscious and powerful, is to begin. The greatest burden of this work necessarily rests on the mother. She has the first care of the child, and she is to lay the foundation of an education that will help the child to develop a strong, symmetrical character. And so I just want to say this in closing that term. Great are the responsibilities before us. But um, 
these responsibilities cannot be compared to the future glory which shall be revealed when Christ comes and say, well done, thou faithful servant, and enter thy rest. We can go back to Christ right now and uh, ask for the strength that is needed because he says, come boldly before the throne of grace in time of need that you may obtain mercy. And this is what we want to do and be sure that we are now following after the Lord in whose coming that we shall rejoice in. Otherwise, may the Lord bless us and may we consider these points as we continue seeking the information and education and the wisdom to be able to raise up our children in a godly way. Shall we pray? Again, our Heavenly Father, thank you for you are teaching us. And we know that it is the grace of Christ which has appeared to all men that teaches, according to Titus 2.11, to teach everyone to deny ungodliness and live soberly in this present world. And this is what we want, the grace which is a tutor and a teacher to us. And so pass us not by as you visit your children. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.